Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome here. Glad to uh, see you here. Welcome to those that are joining us online. Glad that you're here as well. And as academic dean, I have just a little extra thing for you today. Do you know we use a program called Populi? Have you heard that word? Yes. Well, there's things, lots of good information on there. One of those good things under the tab links is the academic guide. And if you go to the academic guide, it'll tell you the date that it was updated. And we updated it a couple of weeks ago. And so I thought, you would be interested to know what we updated. It has to do with final exams. And so here's what the update says. Barring the need to reschedule an exam, and if you read the policy, there is a spot there, a place for you if you have to reschedule an exam. Students who are not registered as high flex are required to take their final exam in person. You are stunned with greatness and gratitude, I can tell. Anyway, you'll think about that, and you'll think about the implications of that. You still have to take your exams. That's all it says. All right. Um, chapel this week. We are uh, continuing in our series, Did Our Hearts Not Burn? Uh, tomorrow, there is service, and then Thursday, impact groups. The Nihil um, Addiction Recovery Network, uh, which we usually say Karn, um, has an assembly on this Friday and then Greatest Needs Chapel next week. Would you please welcome your student union president? Good morning, everyone. Nice to see your beautiful faces this morning. Um, our results for the Goat and Lamb Awards are out, and I'll invite Ellie to read those out. Hi everybody, um, so the winners for the Goat and Lamb Awards, um, so just a reminder, the Lamb Award is, stands for Least Among My Brethren, and it is for a staff or faculty member that shows exemplary Christ-likeness. Um, so this person was described as just an amazing professor, always eager to talk and get to know us, great at what he teaches and gets us involved. So the winner of the Lamb Award for September 2024 is Dr. Newman. And the GOAT award is the same, but for students, it stands for greatest of all time. And this person was described as an incredible, as having an incredible gift of encouragement, from kind notes to offering to pray for others or asking how they're doing. Um, she glows with the kindness and encouragement of Christ. She always has a kind word and is genuine and open-hearted. So the GOAT award winner is Eliana. Okay, for most of you, I'm sure you remember the screaming goat. That is on its way. Um, <laughs> okay, um, I'll invite Eric quickly to talk about Wednesday Night Communion. All right. Next Wednesday, not this Wednesday, but next week, is our first Wednesday Night Communion. All of our upperclassmen students, whoa, I'm in front of, that's okay, sorry, that distracted me. All of our students that were here last year probably remember what this is. Freshmen, this is a time where we get to gather together as a community, eat a meal, and celebrate the Lord's Supper together. So this will be occurring next Wednesday. I'm going to send an email out right after chapel. It'll be in the Maxwell Center starting at 6 o'clock. What I am asking everybody to do is, in order for us to have food, is we have to have food. So I need everybody to think of their best chili recipe, prepare their best chili recipe, and bring it on Wednesday so we can share our best chili recipe with all of our friends, okay? On that email, there'll be a sign-up sheet as well for people to bring bread, to bring juice, to bring cutlery, to bring anything that we may need to make this event special and fun. Everyone is welcome, staff and students, and I would love to see everybody there. 
Um, we'll partake in communion afterwards, we, after we eat, and then we'll also have worship afterwards. So be on the lookout for that next Wednesday, October 9th at 6 o'clock. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so quickly, let me just run down with what we have for this week. There's going to be Wednesday morning prayer tomorrow, um, 8.30 in the loft. And there's also Wednesday night worship in the evening by 8 at Parable Place. You're all welcome. And this Thursday, we're going to have a special coffee house. It's going to be a talent show coffee house. So April is going to send out an email later. Look out for that, and then you can get more information from that. Um, so just a few updates. We had um, birthday gift donations for Rosario that you all contributed to, and we really appreciate your giving. Um, we were able to get um, $61.95, and thank you guys for giving. Um, Candy Bowl was a huge success. Thankfully, no one was taken to the emergency room, and everyone was happy at the end of the day. So thank you all for coming. Uh, God bless you. Great, thanks Elijah. One more announcement is that uh, today from 11 until 1.30 is the last opportunity for photo retakes. So if you didn't like the first version, you can go for the second version. Uh, for photo retakes, that'll be in the marketing studio which is over in that direction. Okay, as we begin chapel this morning, I invite you to stand and I want to read a few verses from Psalm 86. It says, among the gods, there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your presence as a prairie community. Indeed, you have done marvelous things, and we only need to look at our own lives and give you thanks for where you've brought us from, the things that you have forgiven us for, which we thought would be might impossible, but nothing is impossible with you. And so we bow with gratitude and with praise. In Christ's name, amen.
Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory.
seated. Thank you, team, for your work. I do love hearing a room full of college students sing these songs. I think, yeah, hear it up. Yeah, amen. You know, God has a plan to change the world. And I think he has a plan to use some of us Um, Let me try and turn some of you to do that with young people, college age people who can sing these with their heart and carry this message to the world. It's hard to imagine what God can do with that. I'm delighted to welcome our speaker this morning. He shares the joy that we have here, that I have personally here, of hearing a room full of college students sing songs like this, because he comes from enemy territory. (laughs) It's my good friend, Michael Powelke, Dr. Michael Powelke, who got his doctoral degree from an outstanding school that seems to be showing up more and more often here among our faculty, and that is Gordon-Conwell. He also got his master's before that from Dallas Theological Seminary, where we um, borrowed their formula for coverage of the Bible with four Old Testament and three New Testament courses so that every degree-earning student gets a good reading of the entire canon of Scripture. And that's kind of at the core of what we do or the heart of what we do, because it will carry you through many different situations, many different careers. Michael comes here, one, to speak as my friend, two, as a friend of the Lord Jesus, three, as a leader of a fellow school, a sister school, four, to represent their seminary. He is to steal no students for his undergraduate program. Let me be clear. But we would be delighted to hear that you are going to uh, Briarcrest for your seminary training if that's the direction you choose to go, meaning on to graduate school and go there for your next level of schooling. That would be delightful. We're continuing our series in Hebrews. Uh, Michael has the joy of bringing us a chapter, the section out of Hebrews 3 and edging into 4 on um, standing firm. And may God help each of us to stand firm with Christ as our foundation through our lives. Wander on up here, Michael, while I pray for you. Our Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the delight of coming to get our batteries recharged here this week, this day. I pray that you would give us that greatest gift of all, your Holy Spirit. Enliven our hearts Fill Michael to overflowing so that he will spill over onto us. Bless him in this work so that he can be a blessing to us. We ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Great. Thank you so much, Mark. It's, it really is a pleasure to be here with you today. And, uh, you know, that's usually what guest speakers start off with, but it, it really is. And let me just say, I, I've, I've got a piggyback a little bit on, on what, what Mark said, uh, just being here for worship. And I got to say, where's your guitar? Ta- stand here, brother. I, you gotta, take a look at this, this jersey he's wearing. I, I like this jersey. Yeah. There you go. Um, but I want you to know, this, is, this, is, this time period is hugely uh, strategic because, um, quite frankly, th- this is optimal prime educational space. And uh, we do our, our daily chapel as well, same, 10 to 10. Uh, but we, um, uh, we've chosen this time, you've chosen this time, because this is a time when we're, we're sharp. We're, I hope you're sharp. Uh, we're attentive, we're engaged, and it's an opportunity to hear uh, from, from God and for God to minister to us in deeply significant and, and we hope, uh, profound ways. Um, but thank you for, for being here. I... I um, I, I, I've got to just simply say, Mark, uh, I have such high regard for your president. Um, 
And yes, indeed, we are friends. We cheer each other on. Whenever we uh, are at the same conference or same gathering, uh, we, we always have a meal together and, and uh, share uh, the uh, uh, beefs and bouquets of, of, of uh, Christian higher education. And uh, I, just, I just bless you as an institution and for all you're doing. We are partners, truly, and, and as much as we kibitz over sometimes some gentle competition, we, we are partners. And as, as, uh, I'm here uh, to share the word, but if any of you want to talk about seminary education, uh, uh, whether it's Christian ministry, whether it's advanced biblical studies or theological studies, whether it's uh, leadership and management, or whether it's counseling, uh, or uh, our emphasis, our growing emphasis on co-vocational, which is another way of saying tent making. We're going to see much more of that in the coming days, just the tremendous uh, cost of, of living in urban settings and uh, the challenges we're facing. Yeah, you, you're, you're hearing the statistics, right? You know that uh, there's is going to be a tremendous attrition rate in, in, in church leadership, and uh, there are so few of us uh, that are committed to, to serving the church in this way. So I just want to commend and bless you, and I'm so grateful for Mark. Uh, pray for your leaders. Pray for your president. Pray for your academic, uh, your vice president academic or provost. I'm not sure, Mark, what your title is, but uh, uh, your leaders are their servants t- to you and and the mission of the church uh, in Canada and certainly uh, beyond. Well, I understand you're working through the book of Hebrews. This is a tremendous book. And uh, I, I love this theme of did our hearts not burn? It's such a beautiful picture of the road to Emmaus. And, and as we think of Hebrews, Hebrews is largely dealing with the supremacy of Jesus, right? Like, wow, he's just, he's greater than the angelic world, chapter one. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than the law. He's greater than all these uh, highly regarded themes that particularly this audience was acutely dialed into, right, as as Jewish believers. And, And the concern that the author of Hebrews was particularly addressing was this concern of them slipping back into the the, the, the entrapment of, of legalism, of Judaism. And he was desperately concerned that they not drift away or slip back. And so this is on the mind, a dominant concern that the author of Hebrews is is addressing. Now, drift and deconstructing is almost become hip and in vogue, right? And there's likely not a one of us in this room who doesn't have a friend that somehow has drifted or deconstructed or abandoned their faith. And... That's heartbreaking. I was asked recently, I, I'm often, what, what's, what's your favorite part of your job? And, and what, what's the most challenging? What's the most discouraging? And without question, uh, when I hear of grads from our institution who have drifted, that's like, it's heartbreaking. And you have it here too. And it happened in the first century where people drifted. And so this morning, we're going to talk about standing firm and not drifting. So to do that, I want us to look at um, a critical passage that Mark referenced. But I just want to remind you that there are some five warning passages in the book of Hebrews. And if you indulge me, I just want to take you to the first one briefly, and we'll look at the second one in chapter 3. But go back to chapter 2, okay? And in chapter 2, uh, we have the first warning the first challenge given to these Hebrew believers, these Jewish believers. And he starts by saying, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away. First of all, of course, you see therefore, what's it there for? And he's just been talking about the triumphant, authoritative, supreme act of Jesus in his person and his work, demonstrating his authority over the the supernatural world, the angelic world, both of good and evil, and his triumph. And he's saying, in light of this, the wonder of who Jesus is, we need to give acute attention, pay much closer attention to the capacity that we have to to drift away. And this word, to drift away, is only used once in the New Testament right here. This idea of slipping away, drifting away, abandoning. And so he's he's acutely concerned about this propensity, about this this possibility. And and drifting might be a, a drift in interest, it might be a drift in our, our core values, our core morality. 
It, it might be adrift in, in some of the real key anchoring theological truths that we cherish and have held on to and held in such high regard. It might be adrift relationally from our church or from key relationships that are in our lives, maybe even family relationships. But drift happens. It is a law of physics, the law of entropy, this, this whole second law of thermodynamics, whereby if you don't feed a system, if you don't feed an energy source, it will diminish, it will deteriorate, it will, it will slow down unless it's refueled. All relationships need that kind of energizing, that kind of attention, because if we don't, we will drift. There will be a decline. And so right now, some of you love your church, but that love can be diminished. Some of you, you love your jobs. I'm talking to staff here today, you, you love being here at Prairie College. But if you don't feed that, if you let yourself start dwelling on negative things and your heart start, you can start not liking your job. And that can drift. And those of you who are married here, you need to feed that really because that relationship, that marriage, really, it can drift if it doesn't get attention. And so here we're told that is a capacity that we can have. Now, the next several verses in this first warning, for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord and it was attested to us by those who heard while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed among according to his will. So here his focus on how should we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? And, and, and here he then talks about consequence or literally the word he uses here is retribution if we allow ourselves to drift. Now, full candor here, my focus this morning, I want to talk about drift. I want to talk about standing firm. But I at least have to acknowledge this because this comes up in chapter three as well. Who's he talking about? Because here the author's saying we. Is he talking about we the human family? Well, if he's talking about we the human family, does the human family drift? Well, they have to be in before they can drift. Who, who's he talking about? It seems to be talking about believers. Because believers can drift. Okay? So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. That he, he, he's, if this is a difficult theological. Who is he talking about? Well, he seems to be talking about believers, okay? And he's warning them of this capacity to drift from their faith. Now, let's go to the second warning, the second challenge, and that's in chapter three. And in chapter three, the first part, uh, like in chapter one, he talks about Jesus' supremacy over angels. In chapter three, he starts to talk about the, uh, Jesus' supremacy over Moses. And Moses was held in such high regard, the giver of the law, walking Israel through deliverance from Egypt, through the wilderness experience, and finally to the, the precipice of, of, the, of the promised land. And he says, Jesus is greater than Moses. But then, he quotes from Psalm 95. Listen to what he says in chapter three, starting verse seven. Therefore, because of Jesus' supremacy over Moses, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Hmm. On the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they are always going astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall never enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another, and every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So what the author does here is he takes us back to Psalm 95. And I want to take your attention to Psalm 95 because I want you to understand the context of Psalm 95. This is a Psalm of David. 
And, and David takes them back all the way to the wilderness experience. So let me, let me turn your attention to Psalm 95 here. He starts with this, this extolling psalm, these truths of the wonder of God. And he says, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord as we just have done this morning, right? Let's sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving and let us make a joyful noise to him in song and with praise. For the Lord, is, the Lord our God is a great God and great king above all gods. In his hand are, are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are also his. Uh, the sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down, and let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. And this, this image, this metaphor that so dominantly occurs in the Old Testament of, of God being our shepherd. And then, of course, Moses was a shepherd. David was a shepherd. This image of God tenderly leading us as sheep, though prone to being wayward at times, tenderly leading us. And then he says, today, if you hear his voice, today, if you hear his voice, takes a hard left here. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day in in Massa, in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their hearts and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. That's a tough passage. And the author of Hebrews quotes David, David referencing the story of in the wilderness, you can read about it in, Acts 17, in Exodus 17 and Numbers 20, where the people, having been delivered from bondage, having seen miraculous displays of God in their deliverance, and now, as they're on their way to the promised lands, they start grumbling and complaining, we liked it better back in Egypt. And Moses is frustrated, Moses is perplexed, Moses is confused, and he's wrestling with God because the people are so dissatisfied and and so struggling. We know the word Meribah means strife, Massa means testing, because the people strove with God. So who is he talking about? Well, Hebrews, the author of Hebrews is talking about believers, He takes us back to Psalm 95, who's talking about Israel. And let me take you back to Exodus 14. You can do your own study in this. But in Exodus 14, it it describes how the people are at the edge of of the sea. And it says they, they believed God. And according to the scripture, belief in God is accreditation of righteousness, right? That's how Abraham's faith was acknowledged. And Isaac and Jacob... Here, the people believed God when they put blood on the doorpost and lintel as the angel of death went over their homes. So the people left Egypt in faith. They came to the edge of the Sea of the Red Sea in, in faith. They crossed over that sea in faith because it was, it was a sea and they walked across it. And now this same community of faith is, is struggling. And, and, and God was brokenhearted by it. Now again, uh, my, my time is brief, and I'll let you wrestle this with your, your, your faculty members uh, in your dorm conversations. But this is a tough passage because Hebrews is speaking to believers. The author of Hebrews is speaking to believers, and he's warning believers that we have the capacity to drift. So what are the implications of apostasy? Well, in chapter 2, he talks about retribution. He's not necessarily talking about eternal judgment. And here he's speaking about not entering that rest. And may that just be a fuller sense of resting in the Lord, the precursor we have to the ultimate rest of salvation. Frankly, theologically, I'm of the mind that once we're in God's grip, he doesn't let us go. When I read the end of Romans 8, I'm going like, I'm secure. I'm secure. But he still warns us that we can drift. And in our drifting, we effectively rob ourselves of the joy and wonder of the spiritual rest 
that we have. And let me just speak experientially, not just theologically here for a moment, but when I'm abiding in Christ, when Jesus uses that imagery in John 15, or as many of the epistle writers talk about being in fellowship, being in communion, a discipleship relationship, surrendered, what, whatever kinds of similar synonyms you might choose to. But, but when I'm walking in that kind of clean, fresh, abiding relationship, I enjoy the rest of God. And I know there's an ultimate rest coming, right? But I enjoy that rest of God. We know what that's like. But the, the author of Hebrews warns us, he said, you, you, you can drift from that rest you can drift from that abiding and you introduce yourself to the, the discipline of God and the loss of that joy. And so the, the thrust of these two, and then if you read the other three warning passages in Hebrews, is stand firm. Don't drift. Stay engaged. Because the second law of thermodynamics, the law of physics, the law of entropy tells us that if we don't energize a relationship, if we don't energize our thought, if we don't energize our faith, you and I have the capacity to drift. Every one of us. Every one of us. And I know you've heard some of the crashes, crash and burns lately of, 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 of leaders. Do not speak with too harsh a judgment there because you and I are all just one or two bad steps from being in the ditch ourselves. Okay. So my plea, my encouragement to you today is to stand firm, do not drift, and stay engaged in those ever so basic spiritual disciplines. So I, I brought with me a, a little Gideon New Testament that I was given, and I'll tell you, in 1970. Okay. Yep, the the hair's real, it's, it's gray, it's white, it's, I know it. But I was given this in grade five. I was not raised in a Christian home. Uh, my parents split up a couple of years later, um, very destructively, and I lived with my mother. But in grade five, I was given this little Gideon New Testament. And I remember the Gideon representative there. we're giving you this as a gift. This is for you to have. Uh, and I want you to open it up and put your name because it's our gift to you. This is your Bible. And I did it. And I could, I, Michael, and I've got a peace sign over the eye. Uh, anyway, um, but that's, that's what I did. But then he said, now there's, a, there's an opportunity for you in the back page to also put your name. But we, I don't want you to do that unless you understand what you're doing. And I, even as I'm telling you this story, and I remember I checked out. I don't know what he said. But a couple of years later when my parents were splitting up, I remember this little book. I started reading it. I learned about Jesus, and I trusted Christ. And in this, in this preamble, in the, in the introduction to added Gideon information to the, the New Testament, there's a story about a man named John Nicholson who made a commitment to his mother to read his Bible every day. And I didn't know a thing about what a Christian lived like. I didn't know liberal, conservative, Catholic, Protestant, evangelical, mainline. I, I had no, I had, all I knew was I should read this, and I should find a church. And I started reading this. And I've sought to read this book every day of my life. And yesterday I was in, in finishing up Acts. This morning I was in Romans. Nothing to do with the sermon, <laughs> just that's my Bible reading. And I've said this in our chapel, and I'll say it here at Prairie Chapel. If you leave with the discipline of being in this word, you leave with a tremendous spiritual discipline that will significantly place you on the retention side, not on the deconstructing side. Your involvement in a Christian community, in a spiritual community, in a church, so desperately vital. And I know, and I, I know Mark does too, I know of mission heads and leaders of Christian institutions who don't go to church. Say what? Seriously. You, you make yourself vulnerable to drift. And so these ever so foundational spiritual disciplines are so critical. Stay engaged. Stay engaged because you and me, we all have this capacity to drift. 
Now, I know it's not hip and trendy and current homiletics and preaching strategies to read old stories or old hymns, but I was really pleased that you sang a hymn today. But Robert Robinson uh, came to faith in his early 20s, and he trained to be a, a pastor, would become a pastor, and he wrote a, a, a number of hymns, and one of them was Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. I don't, do, you read, do you sing that here? It's, 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 a, it's a wonderful hymn, but the, I believe it's the third verse. This is how it goes. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. And then he says, it's prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but the next time you sing it here or the next time you're at your home church singing it and you're hearing other people sing it, it's remarkable. You're here because I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm tuned. I try to listen to this. But when people sing this verse and they sing about prone to wander, people actually sing with greater intensity because somehow within us we know that we're prone to wander if we don't feed it. Prone to leave the God we love. Today, if you hear God's voice, do not harden your hearts like the people of God did in the wilderness. And right now today, some of you are on some sort of edge of a decision. And maybe you're in a relationship and that relationship is progressing and you're at some sort of edge of a bad decision. Or maybe you're struggling with some particular biblical theme or theological theme and you're, and, and you're, you're just on some sort of edge. Or maybe there's some experience you've gone through and you're angry and that anger has all the potential of turning into bitterness, turning into some sort of deep root of bitterness that will, could consume you for, for years. Happens. Or maybe you're doing really well, but you are no less vulnerable to drift. And so the author of Hebrews was desperately concerned about the people falling back into old patterns. In their particular case, the entrapment of legalism. In our case, it might be falling back into something else, but you and I can fall back. Stay engaged today. As you hear God's voice, do not harden your hearts. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, these are tough passages. We've got to give more thought to it. But one thing is abundantly clear as we interact with this passage. You know our human hearts. You, you know our capacity to drift. And Lord, we want to acknowledge that to you today. That it's not with a sense of cocky spiritual arrogance that we come to. It's with humility we come to you asking you to remind us afresh that we are in your grip. And Lord, give us the strength to stay engaged, to stay in your word, to stay on our knees, to stay in community, to stay in service, to have a heart of gratitude. And even with all the craziness that surrounds us, to, to see the blessings that are also surrounding us. Lord, I pray for every person in this room here. I don't know them by name. I know so few. But Lord, we're all vulnerable. I'm vulnerable. I just pray that every one of us in this room would continue to enjoy the wonder of the rest of our salvation so that one day we might enjoy the ultimate gift of that Sabbath rest that Hebrews talks about. So Father, we commit ourselves to you afresh today. We want to hear your voice, and when we hear it, we're going to trust, and we're going to obey. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.